You know, I'm just so excited for this trip because not only are we going to be actually using the telescopes, you know, doing some observations, making up for that lost time back in January when the telescopes froze shut because of a freak snowstorm, but we're also actually going to La Palma. Like it feels real now because I've just booked all my flights, I've booked my accommodation at the top of the mountain and I'm just, this is the first trip like post pandemic, right? Like I'm so excited. A volcano erupts on the Canary Islands. The army is called in as thousands are evacuated. And here's the molten lava that's on the move. A slow motion menace inching relentlessly downhill. This is a live geology lesson in nature's unstoppable forces. And it's not just property. Just had the email through. The observatory shut and they've advised us not to travel. I kind of saw this coming. Still sad about it though. Now, obviously the eruption on the Palmer is horrendous for all of those who are directly affected. I feel so much for those who've either lost their homes or have been forced to evacuate their homes or have lost their livelihoods because of this eruption, the first in 50 odd years. The first since the observatory was built on top of the mountain. And I know not being able to observe with a telescope is the least of everyone's concerns here in this whole catastrophe that's happened. However, I thought that some of you might be curious as to why volcanic ash specifically is such a big deal and is such an issue for astronomical observations and also for the observatory itself. Now, obviously any volcanic eruption where you have lava flow, if the observatory was in the way, that would be a huge deal. Now, thankfully the eruption was actually on the younger southern half of the island, whereas the observatory is on the northern, older, more stable part of the island. So when the eruption first went off on Sunday, the 19th of September, the observatory at the top of the mountain in La Palma, the Roque de la Mochachos observatory, it just wasn't affected at all. And that's because it was far enough away from any lava flows. And there was a northeasterly wind that meant that any volcanic ash was taken away from the island and it didn't come anywhere near the observatory. Then by the 23rd of September, the wind had changed and volcanic ash had been brought over to the observatory. Now, thankfully that night it was cloudy. So the telescope domes were shut, which protected them from any of the ash. But it was very clear when the support astronomers arrived at the observatory in the morning to do the maintenance work that the telescope domes that usually are shut to protect all of the um, telescope from the elements were covered in a very fine layer of volcanic ash. And this is the issue. You do not want volcanic ash going anywhere near your million quid telescope. So the first issue is moving parts being affected by volcanic ash. So volcanic ash is not soft and fluffy like the ash you get off a fire you might light in your house, right? You know, when the kindling sometimes poofs off this little floofer that floats away in the air, right? Volcanic ash is really rough and abrasive. So if that gets into any moving parts, it can be really damaging. And there's a lot of moving parts on telescopes. The domes themselves will move around on a track with the actual telescope as it looks in different parts of the sky, because you've got that little slit that the telescope sort of looks out of. Again, that's to help protect it from the elements. Obviously, the telescope itself moves because it drives to look at a certain position, a certain coordinate in the sky. So if any ash got into those moving parts, that would be incredibly damaging. The second issue is ash in your electronics. Although the telescope that we were planning to use, the Isaac Newton telescope, was built in the 1970s, it has obviously since then been updated with all of your mod cons. Everything's driven by computers. I could even type a command here in Oxford into the computer and the telescope would move in La Palma. It can all be operated remotely. But what that means is that there's then a lot of electronics that are susceptible to damage from volcanic ash. So for example, if ash got into a vent, if it blocked a vent, or it jammed a cooling fan on some electronics, that would be incredibly damaging because then they would overheat. Lots and lots of monetary damage that all your parts need new replacing. Then of course you've got the issue of ash shorting out electronic circuits. So ash is rocky, it will have little bits of metal in it, and so it can short out circuits. Again, causing lots and lots of damage. Then you've got even things like keyboards, right? Keyboards have all these holes in them that the ash can get into and they're incredibly susceptible to that as well. So ash in your electronics is not something you want. The third issue and probably the biggest here is that volcanic ash massively affects the observations you can take 
and specifically how good those observations are. So most astronomical observatories are built away from light pollution and usually high up a mountain. So yes, that's the Canary Islands, but also the Atacama Desert in Chile, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, the middle of the outback in Australia, and also in South Africa as well. They're great locations because the air is thinner the higher you go, which means you're looking through less atmosphere. Less atmosphere means less water vapor. It means less turbulence in the atmosphere as well. Think about when you get on a plane and you experience turbulence. That's pockets of air that are different temperatures or pressures that shake about the airplane. Imagine what that does to light as it comes through the atmosphere as well. So think about like what causes stars to twinkle, right? Twinkle, twinkle, little star is caused by the atmosphere. It's caused by variations in the atmosphere. And it means that your image moves around. It ends up being really fuzzy. So rather hilariously, twinkle, twinkle, little star is kind of an astronomer's nightmare. It's more like twinkle, twinkle, little star, how annoying you are. <laughs> So we do have ways of removing a lot of this normal disturbance that you will get in the atmosphere. It's what's called adapted optics. If you've ever seen a laser firing out of the top of a telescope, what it's doing is recording how the tiny point of the laser beam is changed as it goes through the atmosphere. And then it adapts the mirror that's collecting all that light. It actually deforms it so that when the light reflects off it, it will focus on the telescope as a perfect point of light and remove all of that atmospheric turbulence. So obviously that can be used to correct for normal atmospheric conditions like different pressures, different temperatures, maybe even high humidity. But if you've chucked a load of particles into the atmosphere, whether that is clumps of volcanic ash or maybe even something like a, like a dust storm as well, like think about like sand in the air, then any light that's coming in from a star or a galaxy through the atmosphere is essentially gonna end up taking a path that resembles more like a pinball machine, right? It's just gonna ping from particle to particle, again, getting completely disrupted on its way down to you, and you're gonna end up with the fuzziest image ever. So even if by some miracle, the ash lifts up higher into the atmosphere and it's no longer an issue on the roads, making driving dangerous up to the mountain, and it's not no longer like collecting on the dome. So it's gonna be an issue to the electronics or any of the moving parts. Even if it lifts and it's still higher in the atmosphere, there's still no point in opening because you're not gonna get the high quality observations that you need to do the science you want to do. And so that's the position we're sort of in now is that we're really hoping for the best. We're saying, OK, we can't travel to the observatory. Fine. You know, there is an emergency going on the island and we're going to respect that. And it's not safe for us to travel and it's not safe for us to be there when we get there either. So what I'm really hoping for now is that maybe by like Friday, we have some good news that the eruption has slowed and maybe the wind direction has changed and, and takes all of that ash away from the observatory and that we can actually open, you know, with the support astronomical will be on the mountain and, and us sort of switching to nights working from home over the weekend as well. I've got all my fingers and toes crossed that that actually happens. And if it does, then next week's video will be a vlog of what we actually observed and, and how that observing went. So yeah, fingers crossed. If you want an update, you know, this is getting posted on Thursday, a couple of days later. So if you want an update of whether that actually did happen, keep an eye on my Twitter and Instagram and I'll let you know if we did actually manage to open and if we did get some, some good news or not. Fingers crossed, everyone, because you know what? After the 18 months that we've had, like, and the fact that we had time in January on the same telescope to do the same thing, but there was a freak snowstorm that hit, you know, which was the craziest of thing. You know, Madrid hadn't had snow in however many years. The Palmer hadn't seen it. The telescope domes all froze shut. So that was weather and that meant, oh, okay, never mind. You don't get your time back. You just have to apply again. And we thought, let's apply for September because it'll be a safer bet than January in terms of weather. And now this has happened. All I want for my PhD student right now is just some data. And I really hope we get it. This isn't really a blooper. It's just something funny I found while editing this video. So it's now Wednesday afternoon and We've already heard from the observatory that we're not opening tonight, which should have been our first night observing, so fine. So after we heard that from them, I was like, I wonder how long volcanic eruptions in La Palma have lasted in the past, and if that'll give us an idea about whether I should get hopeful for opening. And I found this paper from 2010 um, that looks at the risk of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions to a lot of the major observatories in Hawaii and La Palma, 
and Chile. And in that paper, it said that La Palma eruptions on average in the past have lasted anywhere from 24 to 84 days. So now I'm really not that hopeful at all that will open. Um, but I did enjoy the last sentence of this abstract, which says, the lowest geological hazard in both seismic and volcanic activity is found at Roque de la Muchachos Observatory on the island of La Palma. That was written in 2010. It didn't age well, did it?